It's a wonderful pleasure to welcome sporting legend and tireless champion for fairness in sports. It's Sharon Davies. Sharon, how are you? Hello, I'm really well, thank you. Let me just move that. Oh, there I am, right in the middle. Good evening. There to you, you are. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the protocol for sporting legends? Do I have to curtsy? Is there? Oh, a, no, no. Just a, call me Sharon, please. I'm much Sharon. That way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm happy that you're here because I've finished reading your excellent book, uh, Fair Play. And it, it, it's a perfect distillation of the problem we have with the ideology, the impact it, it's had, it's having right now on, on women's sports. But it's much there historically that I, I wasn't really aware of. So it's a, it's a yeah. great, great primer on that as well. Um, I suppose just to jump in, there's so much to jump into on that. But I suppose one of the things uh, might be interest to people. Um, I mean, there's a number of people who just won't accept there are any sex-based differences. They, they assume a lot of this is cultural, and I, I'm not sh entirely sure we can reach those people. But some have been misguided into believing uh, a lot of this could be mitigated in sport, you know, weight yeah. divisions, testosterone levels, things like that. And I don't necessarily blame them for thinking that because that was policy for, for the longest time. Maybe you can just explain why e even mitigations are complete non-starter when it comes to these disparities. Yeah, and it, and it shouldn't have been. You know, these are sweeping moves that the ISC made in 2015 that was based on absolutely no science altogether, an incredibly poor study by Joanna Harper, which was very biased. Um, it was over a period of 20, 20 years with people self-reporting. So, you know, no idea of whether they had injuries or whether they'd been training or, or, or anything whatsoever. Um, and uh, basically saying after 20 years, they got slower, which, you know, after 20 years, I got slower. But after 20 years, they got slower, you know. <laughs> so, so it was really a very rubbish piece of, of study. Um, and it's, it's been lambasted all over the place. And that was the only piece of study that the IRC looked at. And yet there were studies all, all over the shop showing that reducing testosterone made practically no difference whatsoever. You know, it was really, really minimal. Um, the biggest study we've got came out of Brazil last September. And that was after 14 years. And even after 14 years, we can hardly remove any advantage that testosterone has given you. But then that's not talking about the advantages that comes from being taller, having bigger hands, having bigger bone structure, having stronger ligaments, having a different cue angle. You know, for example, women footballers, six times as many ACL and knee injuries because of their cue angle. So the cue angle is your angle between your hips and your knees. And obviously, because us ladies are giving birth to babies, we have much bigger hips. And so this creates more stress. And then to make that even worse, our ligaments and tendons are much more flexible for exactly that reason, which stops them being so so strong and so able to you know combat injury. So there are lots and lots of reasons why biologically male and females are extremely different, and reducing testosterone is a total red herring. It, it does nothing and never did, and it is just so disturbing. And you mentioned you know the, the fact in the book we talk a lot about the battles for women's sport since the modern Olympic Games and how Pierre de Coubertin did everything in his power to keep women out. And, you know, it's it's been so hard to get any sort of parity. And we have nowhere near parity. I mean, when I won my medal in 1980, there were four times as many men as there were women. And it took until the mid 80s before we had any females on the committees whatsoever. And even now, we only have a couple and they come from the Middle East and North Korea, you know, those great bastions of women's sports, she says, ironically. So it, it's we still have a very misogynistic world when it comes to sport, the people that run sport, you know, it's very hard to get women that are powerful voices into positions where they have actually any say. Yeah. I mean, what, what I especially like about your book as well, it's, it's data driven. Uh, you know, you invoke a lot of peer reviewed studies. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a shame that we have, you have to do a lot of this for things that which are blatantly obvious on the face of it. Yeah. The face of it. But why, why are the the powers that be, so unreceptive to scientific facts on, on, on this issue? Why, why is it they opt towards uh, some misguided idea of inclusion or progressive identity politics over the actual scientific reality? So part of it was the IOC's decision and then everybody else was running scared, you know, to actually put in a different position. Um, they didn't speak to any female athletes whatsoever. It took seven years before any form of governing body spoke to a single female athlete. The actual main stakeholders as to how they felt about it. They didn't poll because they knew if they polled, then you know, again, all the athletes, men and women, would turn around and say, we want fair sport. So this was just a move to include transgender women, that's trans identifying males into women's sport and basically saying to women, well, you're not worthy. Men are worthy of force, fair sport. We're gonna carry on with water and we're gonna stop anyone that has the tiniest advantage in men's sport because that's cheating. But you ladies, you can just suck it all up and have people in races with you at the Olympic Games that have a 30% biological advantage. 
just because we're going to use this clever magic word inclusion. And there was ways that you could be inclusive without throwing women's sport under the bus, you know, and I think that's what I've always, that I have such a big problem with, that we made such great strides in, work, in women's sport. And then again, we were literally just kicked to the curb as if our opportunities and our chances of success and careers just did not matter. And what's so heartbreaking is that even today, most of the mainstream media are only interested in the feelings of transgender women. They're not interested in the feelings of actual women in classifications for women so they can have equality who are literally losing their chances, losing their dreams, losing the thing that they've worked for for 10 years of their life because someone transitioned 18 months ago who'd never even got on a bike before. You know, yeah, and I, I, it's just outrageous that, that there seems to be only compassion for one sex, and those are males. Yeah, there's this excellent sentence at, near the end of the book where you say something like, time doesn't run out for injustice, or, or so words right. of that effect. And, and how, how do we go about redressing the fact that so many women who have dedicated their entire lives to a discipline missed out because, uh, you know, they had a, an insurmountable odd placed in front of them in, in the in the form of a, a biological male i mean how do, how do we address the fact that so many exceptional women have missed out on what's rightfully theirs because of mediocre men yeah i'm not sure we're going to you know because the problem is the rules were the rules at the time so it's a little bit different from the reason why i speak out so much i mean i'm very variable because i was competing during the east german era and so for very different reasons exactly the same result young girls were given through no fault of their own testosterone you know, through puberty, some of them as young as 11, um, which ruined their lives, but made them sporting machines. And so on average, they could make a 9% improvement in a very mediocre athlete and turn them into a world champion to the extent that they won 92% of the European medals during my era. And at my Olympic Games, six podium, one, two, threes, and none in the men, you know, and, and the fact that nobody was going, oh, that's strange. I mean, it's just ridiculous. These athletes would turn up at an Olympic Games. We had never seen them before. You know, they hadn't done any pathways, any Europeans, any age groups, any junior events, nothing. They would arrive at the Olympics and become Olympic champion. And that doesn't happen, you know. And everybody in sport knew that. We all knew it at the time. And the IOC did nothing about it for 20 years. So I have nothing but disdain for the IOC. And they have just carried on the same way. You know, they need a massive clean out. We need a clean out of the IOC. I mean, the amount of money that goes to the athletes that the IOC makes is, is a pittance. It's just disgraceful, really. And they're much more interested in their expense accounts and their five-star hotels and their private jets than they are, you know, central yeah. the athletes, which is what I think the Olympic Games should be all about. Um, I wouldn't mind some of that sweet IOS per yeah. day, for sure, yeah. how you describe yeah. it in your book. They're on um, 700 your dollars a day, I think, is per diems. Per diems mean expenses, but however, every single expense is already covered. So as volunteers, you know, seven hundred dollars a day isn't bad really, is it, as a volunteer? <laughs> And great, great work if you can get it for sure. So, I mean, your your experience uh, of injustice, at, you know, because of the East German doping scandal makes a lot of sense to me why you'd be attuned to this problem before many other people are. But it, it seems that it, it's not a case of being attuned to an upcoming problem. It seems a, a willingness to speak out is at, at the core of this. And you, mm. if, you almost bemoan the fact in your book that there are many prominent people who don't speak up or they do so privately or have to redact their name from petitions and things like that. Is that, is that a great source of frustration for you that there's not, a, there's not enough people from your profession speaking out? Yes, I think because if everyone who feels the way that I do spoke out, this problem would be sorted out instantly. And that's what's so very frustrating. You know, you can understand why terrible things happen in the world because people sit on the fence or people are too frightened to say anything. And then terrible things happen. And then afterwards, we have to kind of claw our way back and we have to try and put things right. And that's kind of where we're at. You know, you mentioned about the females that have lost out for the last seven years will never get those opportunities back. Several women have given up. Um, you know, lots of dads have turned up uh, rugby matches on a, at a weekend and found that their daughter's going to be playing a game of rugby against someone who's male on the opposition and just said, no, you're not playing because that your risk is massively increased that you're going to have a life-changing injury. So, you know, what's happened is we find that girls have been self-excluding or parents have been self-excluding their kids because they just don't want them having, having putting them into a dangerous situation. Um, you know, we've even got a massive problem this summer in particular I've had so many calls from parents who are saying that their children have had sports day at school and the teachers in the school have decided they were just going to have co-ed sports day and not a single little girl came away from sports day winning a race. 
So what message are we giving little girls? You know, we're just telling them they're second class citizens, that they're not worthy of opportunities and fair sports. And not a single piece of science backs this up. Nothing. You know, and there is already very big physical differences, even at seven and eight. You know, little boys have much better ability to throw things and to jump and to be more explosive. And we have all of these stats. You know, we have all of the stats. You mentioned the book. And again, it had to be very carefully researched. I mean, you know, absolutely spotlessly correct. It is watertight, for sure. <laughs> because obviously I knew it was going to be looked at in that way. And it was really important. And part of the reason for doing the book was to give everybody... Um, to arm everybody who wanted to have the gotchas and the stats and the correct information so that they could actually fire back when a lot of this rubbish is put our way. Oh, yeah, you know, sport's not fair because, you know, Michael Phelps has obviously got this most amazing wind span. Well, Michael Phelps is very much the same size as all the other men that were in that Olympic final. <laughs> mm. Yes, he's bigger than a five foot two man, but then a five foot two man is not probably going to go swimming. He's going to go and do something else that his physical abilities work for. Probably you know, a jockey. Again, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, sport is very much re relative to the to physical shape that we are. I'm five foot ten, but I'm not tall in swimming terms. You know, I would have been very average in my race. Um, you know, even, Rebecca, even amongst the women? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. you know, we, we tend to be quite tall with big, big hands and big feet are quite useful. Long levers are quite useful. Um, you know, so we have a shape, long bodies. That swimmers have long bodies. Don't ask me why. I guess it's a bit more like a fish, aren't you? Um, <laughs> you know, the animal world gets it right. So whatever the animals are doing, we tend to copy. Whereas with track, it'll be the other way around. Short bodies and long legs. Rowers are going to be tall because they need long levers. You know, basketball players are going to be tall. Gymnasts are going to be short. Divers are going to be short because they need to tumble and need to tuck. They need to get around quickly. So if you look at, I mean, I used to find the Olympic dining hall, the most fascinating place in the world, sitting there watching, you know, all these people come in that were different shapes and sizes from around the world and just working out what sports they did because of their shape. Oh, um, yeah. And, and, you know, Michael doesn't even hold any world records now. Michael's world record was beaten last week by a six foot skinny French man, you know, so, so that was his final world record. You know, it just because you happen to be tall doesn't mean that we're going to start having races for tall people because we don't have that category. We have category, which was men and women, males and females, the under 10s, the under 15s. I mean, there literally is no difference between me saying, you know, when I was a 15 year old, well, I feel like an under 10, so I want to go race for the under 10s. That's what we've allowed to happen is people just to go, I feel like something I'm not. So just suck it up. Yeah. I mean, you use uh, Leah Thomas as a, a case study in your book, and that's that's one of the huge central injustices at the, at the heart of this. And I'm very grateful for the you know the young American girls who have who have spoke out yeah, about this to great, great yeah the great cost of their reputation and, and personal safety on some occasions, which is utterly you know tragic and unacceptable. And and I, I suppose I'm I'm, not, I'm I'm an eternal optimist and a positive person. And although I accept this Leah Thompson scandal, Thomas rather is a scandal and injustice and should never have happened in a roundabout way, hasn't it really brought this issue to the fjord, fjord front? Yeah, Everybody's absolutely. aware of it now. But what I was trying to stop was the Leah Thomases. You know, was the Chelsea Wolves, what was the Emily Bridges, was the Laurel Hubbards. We shouldn't have to have a man who identifies as being a woman going into a woman's race to prove that men are stronger than women. Because we already know that. You know, that was what was so ridiculous with all of this. We've had to have eight years so far to show what we already know. Because otherwise, why on earth would we have men and women's races if there was no biological difference and no performance difference? It, it, it doesn't, it, there's no logic to any of it. It's just total and utter madness. And so that's why I spoke out quite early because I was trying to stop that. You know, I was trying to stop another 20 years of an experiment in women's sport where women would lose out. And luckily we, we have been able to stop the vast majority of it. And now obviously world aquatics, world cycling, um, world, yeah, what, what else have we got? World rugby, um, British triathlon, British rowing, British badminton. I mean, we're getting more and more sports all the time that are you know, now not being able to ignore the science. But it's almost taken a Leah Thomas in every sport to force those sports to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, it, it took 50 you know, trans-identifying males in North America in cycling, winning major prizes in women's races before world cycling decided this is, this is not fair. 50. We have yeah. 50 at the moment in, in women's English football. And the large proportion of those are in goalkeeps because the, because being the, goalkeeper is the big advantage. 
So yeah. they're tall, but with large hands and more explosive. It works really well for them to be in goal. So, you know, so why do it, does it take 50 before we go, oh, yeah, they're taking the places away from women? How many was it going to take? You know, that's the thing. If we, if, if we hadn't spoken out and tried to push back, you know, before yeah. the, the authorities did the right thing. It's just so disappointing that they had such little value for women's sport. Many of us and uh, had this sneaky suspicion as well that Leah Thomas was in ways, you know, for want of a better phrase, pulling their punches in terms of winning, but not wanting to win too emphatically as yeah. to give the whole game away. Yeah, splits to, to, to yes. know that. You know, so Maybe, as, as obviously it gets a bit geeky when we start talking about splits and people. I love really this because you, you finally, you finally, <laughs> yeah. finally empirically explain something I'd suspected but wasn't able to work out why. Absolutely, so it's great. and we did it in the book. So you know, if anyone's really interested, you can obviously find it and read it in the book. But it's talking about how somebody, as as a perfect, you know, as a, an elite athlete, would would swim a race. And what happened with Leah is that Leah swam the last length faster than any other, which doesn't happen. You know, it just doesn't happen, especially with a dive, especially when you're six foot four, right? So this was because they were holding everything back so that they could only do what was necessary to win or to come wherever they wanted to come. So it was controlling the race. And they had done faster times already that season in very unimportant competitions. So, you know, we could tell, we could tell as professional observers of sport how that race was swum and and how you know they were holding back so they won the one race they wanted to be to be an nc2a champion they became an nc2a champion and then the other events they literally held back so as not to appear like they were winning every single thing and you know we, we, anyone anyone who knows sport knows um you know it's the same as, as watching some of the cycling you know where we've seen trans identifying male knock females off their bikes physically get you know very very robust with them and it's just, it's just heartbreaking, you know, because we've had a couple of cyclists, very, very good female cyclists who've given up because they just felt that their association was against them. And so they just, well, well, what, why carry on, you know, and, and they stopped. So hopefully they'll come back now that World Cycling has decided to protect them. Um, but it's still a battle in North America. I mean, North America is, yeah, North America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, for some strange reason, you know, are, are way behind us. We're doing okay in the UK. We're pushing hard. Yeah, um, Turf Island leaving, leading the way for sure. But um, I, I suppose something to be kind of optimistic about is, like you've mentioned, is the various sporting bodies now revising their their rules and injecting some common sense back into things. And unfortunately, this is being misrepresented quite heavily. Uh, I mean, somebody like uh, Peter Tatchell, for instance, uh, a huge name in, in British gay rights activist. I've, I've interviewed him. I've, I've met him a few times. I've had nothing but positive interactions. But he'll quite openly say or describe this as a, a blanket ban on mm. all trans people from well, sports. We know that, but, but they do that. They use these gotchas, they use this emotive language to try to gain massive sympathy. And they put this, uh, you know, this, this onus on women to be kind all the time. Now, you'd never turn around to male cyclists and say, well, let's let Lance Armstrong race and let's be kind to him. <laughs> then we'd laugh in your face. You know, and that's literally what you're asking us to do. And for starters, when did Peter Tatchell become an expert on sport? You know, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I don't understand why people go to him for comments on sport because he doesn't understand the first thing about sport. So, you know, it, it, it's it's really important to ask people that understand sport and know what they're talking about. Um, you know, we, we wrote a letter to the IOC, oh gosh, way back in 2018. And I had 60 of my friends literally over the space of a weekend. And every single one of those people you would know, they were huge household names, most of them Olympic medalists, all of them either Olympic medalists or world champions, okay? So 60, a lot, that's from the UK. Asking the IOC to do the science first. And of that 60, only five have ever put their head above the parapet. So it is, it is that disappointment that other people don't seem to be fighting for the next generation to have the same opportunities that they had, you know. And I have nothing but absolute contempt for people, for female athletes who are literally pulling the drawbridge up behind them and, you know, and, and being virtual signaling and saying, yeah, let all the men in, let the males come in, let the males compete in women's sport. You know, they've got their success, they've got their opportunities. And, and you know, and I just find that so selfish mm. when we... We've had to work so hard to get where we are. And in the UK, there's a thousand women that earn their living from sport. There's 11,000 men. So we already yeah. have this tiny, tiny piece of the cake anyway. Um, in US sponsorship dollar that comes from sport, 1% of the sponsorship dollar goes to women. 99% of the sponsorship dollar in America goes to men. 4% of the airtime goes to women. 96% goes to men. 
So we have this little piece of the cake already, which is better than it's ever been. And we're, we're working all the time to grow it. But it's, but it's minuscule in comparison to the opportunities that males have. And now we're supposed to budge over for mediocre male athletes who decide that they feel like a woman. <laughs> you couldn't write this. And if someone said this to you 10 years ago, they'd laugh in, laugh in your face. You got yeah. You know, I mean, I mean it, it's, it is, it's just mad, really, that, that we're in this place and that, that people don't seem to have got a backbone to want to, to want to just work with the science and just say, OK, of course, everybody needs to be involved in sport. I'm a huge believer that sport is really important mentally and physically for absolutely everybody. And I, you know, and that's why I've always advocated for this open category. Um, if extra categories is where we want to go, then let's debate it. Let's talk about it. Let's work out how we would do that. But you can't, you certainly can't do it at major international level. You can't give a, an Olympic medal to, you know, the transgender women when there's six of them. I mean, it, it, it you know, and all of them are mediocre athletes. It, it just isn't going to work. You have to turn around and go, right, we're going to have a female category and then we're going to have an open and inclusive category where people can, get, can, people can go in this category and race and identify with respect however they would like. And that is important with respect and with safety. It's, it's vitally important that people are able to be themselves. I would... You know, I would die on that that, that hill to, to to support them as well, but I'm not going to lie about biology. You know, I, I'm just not. That, well, that's an interesting point because we, we talk about this lack of people putting their head above the parapet. But as you know, what you know precisely better than most what happens, especially as a woman with any sort of public standing, when you do this, you know, the, the attacks, the smears, um, you know, that the, the on, uh, online must be a nightmare for you uh, on occasion. And there's almost this alternate alternative reality will be written about you where you're a hateful, transphobic bigot, similar to how they treated J.K. Rowling, for instance. Whereas, you know, in reality, reading your book, it's clear it's coming from a place of compassion you affirm the rights of transgender people it's a very Absolutely. liberal progressive position that you take on a, a lot of this. friends that have transgender children and they're welcome here they come here you know i have no issue i absolutely believe that it's really important that everybody has a right to try and be comfortable with their body with who they are i don't believe that children can decide at 12 and 13 years old that they want to potentially sterilize themselves and take drugs for the rest of their life which will probably shorten their life i think that's too young to make massive decisions like that so it's really important that we verbally support them and hopefully encourage them to go through puberty and then when they come out the other side they can make more more valued better decisions and if as adults that's what they wish to do then we need to support them but i'm not sure that children are able to make those choices when they're not able to to vote to smoke to drink to get married to have a tattoo you know it, it, there are reasons why we have you know restrictions on age um so i think as a society we've got got to understand that and i think again in the uk we are leading someone mentioned the other day it was really fascinating actually that that most of the countries around europe who have national health services are the ones that are you know, putting restraints on ages. And in countries where they have massive capitalism, where there is so much money involved in pharmaceuticals, that's when it's a little bit like the Wild West. And that is very telling, you know. I mean, do you feel you speaking up has cost you opportunities other than maybe reputational? Absolutely. I mean, it's definitely cost me money. Even if people agree, if people are scared, you know, to because they don't want the hassle of the, the trans activists and they make your life a misery. I mean, they do everything in their power. But my, but the God's honest truth, Stephen, is that I would be in a more unhappy place if I sat and watched this happen and did nothing. Because I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Yeah. And I, and there's a knock-on effect, obviously, because there'll be many people looking at you and, and your expertise, your experience, your, your you know, you're a public figure as well. And it, it would have, you know, enabled a lot more people i think to feel more confident about speaking speaking out against this i mean do we have an issue a little bit in the sense that this is also a big political hot potato in the united states at the moment but in the united states it's very much considered a sort of democrats versus republicans you know uh, left-wing progressive versus kind of conservative religious right whereas in the uk it doesn't seem to be that kind of dynamic it absolutely isn't i think they tried for a long time to make it party political and it really isn't um, you know, it's really good to to hear Starmer come out and eventually decide what a woman was. I think that's a very positive thing. Um, but, you know, people like Rosie Duffield have suffered terribly. And I do hope one day he apologises to her because she certainly deserves it. Um, and I do think in time, you know, we will be able to hold our heads up and say we fought against this. You know, I do think in 10 years time, maybe 15 years time, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. But we will look back and go, what on earth were we doing? 
So, so, so you have, we're going to have to be able, you know, we can say that we try to do our bit to stop stop the this massive boulder rolling down the hill and squashing everybody on the way you know stop think look at this practically look at the stats look at the data you know i mean the number of autistic children that think that they're transsexual the number of kids that have had sexual abuse the number of kids that you know are, that come um, from homes rather than you know traditional family setups all these statistics show us that it's kids that have real challenges and that have mental health issues and a lot of them are being fed the lie that by changing sex, it's going to fix all their problems. And it really isn't. It's actually just going to create more problems from the further down the line, you know, problems medically, which maybe they'll never be able to fix. So I, I really worry about what, what's in our future. And sport is, a, is an area where we have a better opportunity of, of showing a biological difference because everybody can really see it with their own eyes. And hopefully then that will filter down into everything else where people will just stop and give themselves a little bit of, of time to have you know to think about this a little bit more logically I just think it's so regressive you know I was a I was a child of this, obviously the 60s 70s and 80s and you know with the 80s you're too young right so I'm, I'm older than you but the 80s were full of men that were wearing makeup and on television and everybody loved them and nobody cared you know we had Boyd George and David Barry and Marilyn and god knows what and T-Rex but yeah, they didn't for one moment said they changed sex. They were just no. men that wanted to, you know, wear makeup and and be outrageous and fantastic, and and we loved them. And it's this thing where we're supposed to deny reality that's the problem. We're not supposed to believe our eyes and things like that. And and that's where it just gets crazy. Um, and also feelings change. You know, feelings change all the time. That, 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 you know, as we age, as with our experiences, with the with the stage in our life, with things that make us happy, things that make us sad. You know, and kids have such a tough time at the moment. Social media and expectation um, has made life horrendous. And we also have massive growing narcissism. <laughs> you know, the, we, the, our kids have grown up in this world where they're constantly online, getting likes and taking photographs and, and expecting other people that they've never met to say that they like them or don't like them. You know, and, and we're not living in the moment enough. And that's why sport is so important. Sport is one of those things where we can actually come back to releasing endorphins, living in the moment, and it's a really healthy thing to do. So I would want everybody, absolutely everybody, to do sport. Yeah. And maybe I can just set you a, a challenge in the under three minutes we've got left. And that's, you speak a little bit in the book about tests that should be commonplace in terms of determining, you know, chromosomes, genders, things like that in sporting competitions. What's the best, most effective, least intrusive way of doing this? Yeah, I mean, I would personally love to see sex screening come back. Um, sex screening was was at the Olympic Games oh, up until only a few few years ago, you know, sort of 15 years ago. The IOC polled its athletes and that came back as 98% of the women said, yes, we want to have sex screening. And they went and 2% said we found it invasive. Now, the ridiculous thing is it's a swab to the inside of your cheek. Right. So if you're doing right, so which takes 10 seconds. If you're doing international sport, you have WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency, sitting there watching you take a pee. <laughs> That's slightly more intrusive. Doping. So if you have a problem with a swab to the inside of your cheek, you really shouldn't be an elite sport. So 98% of women said they wanted that to carry on, and the ISC stopped it. So I would love to see sex screening come back. And, and so we have a female classification and an open classification, and the people for the female classification qualify because of, a, because of sex screening. Um, you know, and it could be quite useful. It could catch young athletes with DSD as well that maybe they aren't aware of it. But again, there's this massive gotcha, you know, that DSD is some sort of hermaphrodite. Human hermaphrodites don't exist. You know, even, even people with DSD, differences of sexual development are still male or female. Yeah. So it's, you know, someone like Casa Semenya has a, has a DSD, which only affects males. Um, she's 46, XY, 5 ARD, internal testes. So when born, had internal testes and therefore the testes weren't seen, the penis wasn't seen. They just thought this was a little girl and off they went. But they developed, you know, physically as a boy and with, with male levels of testosterone. And the first three in the Rio, in the women's 800, all had the same DSD. So the first female athlete came forth and didn't even get on the podium. Yeah, I think people throw that word intersex around like it's akin to mermaid or oh, something gotcha. they kind of yeah they kind of think it's some sort of human yeah. you know female ma uh, male it's hybrid understanding of what it is and, and and it gets used you know to try to beat people over the head that somehow there's a huge number of people in this world that, that don't know what you know that aren't one sex or the other there is there's never been a human ever that's had a small gamete and a large gamete you know ever 
Yeah. Well, Sharon, I, I could speak to you all night about this. And it's, it's great <laughs> to see you le leading the charge on this where fair play in sports uh, concerned. I'd recommend your book. Can I just say one final on. thing to people that are listening. Um, what we can do, what we can do, what you can do at home is to petition your MPs to try to clarify the Equality Act. Because if we can get the Equality Act clarified so that sex, which is how it was written, you know, 2010, everybody knew what it was meant. Now it's been muddied. We need to add the word biological sex. And if we can get biological sex added to clarify, then we have an awful lot of scope with regards to the law with sex discrimination. And that's where I would like to go. That's my next step. I think you need some sort of microphone to drop at this point, Sharon. But thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for speaking to me. You're welcome. Good evening. Have a lovely evening.